you have your Bibles tonight, let's turn to the Gospel of John, the 20th chapter this evening, John chapter number 20. Look forward to seeing you tomorrow night, 7 o'clock. Hope you'll be praying tonight, throughout the day tomorrow, that God will give us a great two nights, three nights, four nights, six nights, 50 nights of meeting as He chooses to meet with us. And uh, let's come with open hearts. You know, God wants to do something for our nation. And if there's ever been a time our nation needs God, it is now. We are rotten to the core as a nation. Uh, Our nation is about like they said about Lazarus in the grave. They said, behold, now he stinketh. Uh, Our nation stinketh tonight because it's turned its back on God. Probably, I've tried to be a historian. I've tried to read a lot about our nation. I don't think there's been a time in our 240 plus years when we have been as far down spiritually as we are right now in this country. And brother, I'm going to tell you, the only thing that's going to change it. Uh, we got some serious things going on in leadership in this nation. But I'll tell you, the only thing that's going to change this nation is God uh, working through the hearts of His people. And if uh, His people don't allow Him to work through them, you can pretty much write this thing off. She's out. She's gone. She's down the stream and no return. And we're fast going in that direction. You know, uh, if you know anything about your Bible, Everything right now is coming together like it's never come together together before. Uh, we're seeing, you know, we've often said, why is it that the United States is not a prominent nation in end time events? And you get to looking at the newspaper and looking at the news, and you see those armies from the east as they could come across uh, the waterway, and they're, they're yoking up China and Russia, the bear up north, in Ezekiel 37, 38. Uh, before you realize it, we're outmanned and we're outgunned. Uh, China has the largest standing army in the world. And then, of course, we've got Russia with all of those nuclear warheads, and China's got them now. China's building aircraft carriers like they're going out of business. And, uh, it, and Iran is, is about to get the, the nuclear weapon. And they want to take the nuclear weapon and they want to nuke Israel. Push them, they, in their words, they want to destroy them off of the face of the earth. And yet, Israel's not going anywhere. God said in the book of Jeremiah, as long as there's a sun and moon and stars, there'll be a Jew. But God is, uh, everything's moving. And it's moving towards the consummation. And it's not taking God by surprise at all. But you know, I still believe God would like to send a spiritual meeting, spiritual revival. If nothing else, just one last effort to get people in before the trumpet sounds. The Lord has not come because He's long-suffering toward us. Not willing that any should suffer, but that uh, perish, but that all should come to repentance. Let's pray for these nights of meetings as Brother Gibbs comes, that God can use him in a mighty way, but he can bring the message right off the altar of heaven, but if we don't receive it, we're still losers. So let's come praying and ask the Lord to do something to us, and do something for us, and do something through us that we can experience a movement of God. Uh, upon our services beginning, well, beginning tonight. Uh, John chapter 20. I'll read our text once again. I never got around to it this morning. Verse number 19. Then the same day at even, being the first day of the week when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad 
when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. Our Lord, I want to say thank you for this day, for what it represents. And Lord, I want to thank you tonight for each one who at the close of this day has once again come to the house of God. Lord, we're here to worship you. We're here tonight to be challenged from your word, and I pray you'll help me tonight just to say the few things that need to be said as we prepare for these days of meeting. Speak to us tonight. May the Spirit of God give me wisdom, anointing, and fullness of his power and his presence, and not only upon my life, but upon all of us in our service tonight and those beyond these walls. And we'll thank you for what you do for us, because we ask this in the name of Jesus and for his sake. Amen. Thank you so much. As we come tonight to this chapter, a very important chapter, I want you to remember that it's the evening of the first day of the week. We're told that in verse number 19. Just a few hours after the tomb has been found to be empty. As we approach these passages again tonight, I want you to notice the setting. We realize that one of the followers of the Lord Jesus is now in hell. I'm talking about Judas Iscariot. He has, he has sold out our Lord. But there's another person who's not present, and that's Thomas. The Bible says a little later in the chapter, but Thomas was not there. And we notice in this, these passages of Scripture that our Lord is meeting now with ten of his disciples. And I want you to notice the mode therein. According to these passages of Scripture, they're in a panic mode. And the reason we understand that is the Bible says in verse number 19 that they're in a room where the doors are shut and they're in a room because they have a fear of the Jews. Now, would you try tonight to understand their feelings and why they're in a panic mode? The Jewish people who have, of course, been responsible for the death of our Savior certainly will be no friends to the followers of the Lord. The Roman officials who cast the death blow upon the Lord Jesus by placing him upon the cross of Calvary, are no friends of grace. And the disciples realize, recognize, that the same crowd that crucified the Lord would probably bring harm to them. And they're terrified. You place yourself in their shoes. You realize that they've just come and taken the one you've followed for three and a half years away from you. They've scourged him. They've beat him. They've nailed him to the cross. They've crucified him. And they've done all that Rome could possibly do to annihilate the person of Jesus Christ. And they realize that this same crowd who has crucified their Lord could possibly do the same thing to them. So they're in a room. The door is closed, and I would not be at all surprised if the door is not heavily locked because they are afraid of what is about to happen to them. 
And not only that, but they remember probably in this same room, just a few hours previous to this time, our Lord has spoken to them in the 15th chapter of the Gospel of John, and he has said to them, remember the word that I sent unto you. The servant is not greater than his Lord. And if they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept, if they have kept my saying, uh, they will keep yours also. And then in the 16th chapter of John, Jesus said, to these followers, they shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. So our Lord has tried to prepare them. Our Lord, knowing that he was going to be crucified, has tried to prepare them for future days and future events. That if they do this to me, Jesus says, they can do this to you also. So they're scared. As we would say in our lingo, they're shaking in their boots. Uh, they are literally horrified. They're terrified. Thinking at any moment the knock could come on the door or the door could be kicked down and they're in the panic mode. Uh, they, they're just not remembering all that our Lord has told them. He has reminded them time after time after time that he would be crucified. And he has reminded them over and over that he would be raised from the dead. But for whatever reason, it's just not registered with them. And so they're, they're panicky. They're scared. They believe at any moment they could be arrested. They could be imprisoned. Their lives could be taken from them. And so they're behind closed doors. They're behind locked doors, terrified of what may happen to them at any moment. But not only are they panicky because they're afraid for their own lives, but there's a second thing that brings panic to them. Now, position yourself here. Think about this. They're in a closed room, scared to death that somebody's going to come and arrest them. And suddenly, in that room, without anyone knocking on the door, without a window being raised, suddenly in that room, right in their presence, Jesus appears. Now, could you imagine that for just a moment? It's no wonder they're in panic mode because they're not aware of how this is all going to come together. They're really not aware of what's going on here. And the Bible says that uh, in verse number 19, notice uh, again, the Bible says that when the, the door's being shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in their midst and saith unto them, uh, Peace be unto you. Now, Luke adds to this. As we put the Gospels together, Luke said they were terrified. And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. But Dr. Luke records, but they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that they had seen a spirit. Now, not only are they afraid of the circumstances of Jews and the Romans, but now they think a ghost has showed up in a closed room. And they're looking at Jesus standing there, and they're again in the panic mode. I remember coming along, and probably some of you remember watching these old crazy programs on television, Casper the Friendly Ghost. You probably remember that. Uh, they, Casper would show, uh, appear, and scare people out of their boots. Uh, these folks just don't recognize all that's going on in the resurrection. They've not been able to comprehend it. 
You know what's amazing about that? The guards and uh, the Roman officials, uh, they come together after the resurrection. And they actually said, that deceiver said that he would be raised again from the dead. And they made provisions by sealing the tomb and stationing Roman soldiers there. They made provision that nobody would come and steal the body of the Lord Jesus away. Isn't that amazing? The enemies remembered what Jesus said, but his own followers who had watched him and observed him for three and a half years did not remember the fact that Jesus said, I must go up to Jerusalem. I must be rejected by the scribes and the chief priests, <clears throat> And I must be lifted up and crucified. But he said, on, and the third day, I will rise again. They forgot that. They're not remembering that. The enemies do, but they're not remembering that. And now suddenly they're scared to death. They're in this room, and all of a sudden, as they're speaking among themselves, they're probably saying, what are we going to do? They're probably going to arrest us. We're probably going to be put in jail. What in the world are we going to do? And suddenly, poof, Jesus is standing in their presence. And now they almost lose their minds. They're horrified. They're scared to death because they think they have seen a ghost. Oh, but wait a minute. I love what this verse says. You know, when we get to the place where uh, we don't know what to do, when we come to that place in our life when circumstances seem to be so against us, you know, if we will allow him to do so, the Lord Jesus Christ will show up and he will strengthen us in our weaknesses. He will help us when we need help. And notice as Jesus stands in their presence in the panic mode. Notice, if you will, in your Bibles tonight, and this is a great application for all of us in this building. Notice what he speaks to them in the last part of verse number 19. Jesus says, peace be unto you. Don't you know that was comforting to them? In this panic mode they're in, to, to realize that Jesus to, can bring peace to troubled hearts. Jesus knew, listen to me, he knew as he knows tonight, he knows what we need. He knew what they need. And you know, not only does he know what we need, the good news is he knows when we need it. And he always comes along and, and shows up at the right time. He's never a minute late. Now, sometimes we think he is. Sometimes we pray about something and it doesn't come uh, to pass the way we think it should. And we have questions and doubts sometimes and we make our own observations about, well, if God really loved me, why would he do this to me? Why would he allow this to happen? And all of the time, the Lord Jesus is preparing us getting us ready for what he wants to do in our life. And here, these people, listen, literally, they have come to the ends of themselves. They don't know what to do. They don't know, they're afraid if they leave the room, they'll be subject to arrest. So in the, uh, in the horrific moment, moments they're experiencing in their lives, Jesus shows up. And Jesus, notice what he does when he shows up. He doesn't give a lecture. You know, it would have been easy for him to say, dummies, don't you remember that I have been for three and a half years preparing you for this moment? He could have easily gave them a discourse. He could have, usually remi uh, he could have easily reminded them of all of the times he had taught them and prepared them for this hour. We didn't go into the details. Down in their heart of hearts, of course, they realized that the Lord Jesus had been there and done so much for them. But all the Lord Jesus needed to say at this time is peace be unto you. I'm glad that the Lord has the ability 
to come to us in the time of our utmost need and meet our needs and fulfill our needs and comfort us when we're discomforted, encourage us when we're discouraged, uh, and minister to us wherein we need to be ministered to. And I want you to understand, my friend, all of us go through our trials, our difficulties, and our downtime. Now, I understand how we feel about it. We always feel that our downtime is worse than our neighbor's. We always feel nobody's really gone through it like we have. And yet, we all have different types of burdens, different types of trials that are brought upon us. The, I, want you to this, I, want you to, I want you to listen to my next statement. It's vitally important. It is not the subtraction of trials that brings peace to us. Sometimes we say, Lord, why don't you get me out of this? And sometimes the Lord said, if you listened to him, you wouldn't have been in it. And sometimes we say, Lord, take this trial away. But could I tell you to, this evening that there are times if what's happening was taken away, we would still have nervous indigestion. Uh, we would still have problems. Uh, we'd still have discomfort. We would still be so horrific in the situation that we find ourselves in. It is not the subtraction of the problems that solves the problem. It is our reliance upon the Lord in the hour of need as he showed up for these disciples and to these disciples in the upper room just when they needed him. So he desires to do that to us. And I'm so grateful that as he comes to us, he can speak peace to our hearts Peace in troubled times. Help when help is needed. Come to our side. In fact, he said, when I send the Holy Spirit upon you, he shall abide with you forever. And he's called a comforter. And the word means someone who's called to our side to help us. He said, I'm not going to leave you in this world by yourself. Listen tonight, church. Don't ever think you're alone in what you're going through. There is a God in heaven who still cares. He's not give up on you. Uh, he doesn't look down on you tonight. He loves you. Look at Calvary. He loves you. Don't give up on him. Let him come into your situation. Let him come into your circumstance and uh, speak peace to your troubled heart because that's what he specializes in. He come at the nick of time, and I'm glad, he, I'm glad he did. Now, all of us, all of us sooner or later are going to have difficult times. I had an email of desperation this morning, and uh, I've had it this week from a preacher friend, and I've been trying to pray for him through the day. Now, a lot of times you have trials and nobody else knows you have them. A lot of times you're going through something. And uh, you may not feel comfortable sharing it with somebody else. And there's all kinds of trials. All kinds of heartaches and disappointments that all of us go through. Could you imagine what these people are feeling, the dilemma they're feeling here in this room behind closed doors? Sometimes people have... Uh, family challenges. But I want to remind us tonight, Jesus never promised us when we got saved. A lot of people got this thing wrong. Jesus never promised us when we got saved that the road was going to always be easy. Jesus never promised us that we're going to have a trouble-free life. Jesus never, never promised us that we won't be challenged down the journey of life. And sometimes, sometimes, it can hit you the hardest from the individual or individuals that you never anticipated would, would turn against you, or, and, and many times in your own family. Uh, I've learned a long time ago when you serve the Lord and you're sold out for the Lord, there's going to be people around you and many times your own family what, that won't understand you. And I want to tell you something tonight. Our job is not to appease family our job is not to appease friends. 
Our job is not to appease, to appease those that we work with or live next door to. Our job, first of all, is to make sure we're in tune with heaven so that when whatever comes our way, we will have the strength that only God can give, the peace that only God can give to say whatever may come, I know that my God is going to see me through this. I'm going to trust him as he comes and stands in my room like he stood in their room. And as he speaks peace to me, I'm going to believe that God is going to come to my side and he's going to see me through the rest of the journey until I stand in his presence. I've got enough faith to believe that no matter come what may, I have the promise that God is going to see me through. And let me tell you something, he can do it because he's a resurrected Savior and all power has been entrusted unto him and that power this evening is available to the church of Jesus Christ. The resurrected Christ stood there in the upper room and he gave them what they needed in that hour. Sometimes it's family. I've experienced it. It's tough. Sometimes it's work challenges. Uh, somebody down on the job, they've... Uh, Oh, how many times have I heard this? They've given their best down through the years and it comes time for somebody to get a pay raise or to get a job promotion and, and they're looked over. And sometimes uh, we say, I don't understand this. But may we remember tonight that in whatever position of life we find ourselves in, we have a Savior who has not abandoned us and our first course of action ought to be that whatever we're facing drives us to our knees. And we say, Lord, I don't understand this. I cannot comprehend this, Lord. It makes no common sense. I don't know what I've done to deserve what's happening to me. But Lord, I've got you. And I'm coming before your presence. And Lord, I, I, I've got to have some help. And I know that you have told me to come before your presence in the time of need that I may find grace to help. And Lord, I'm coming before you. Lord, I'm appealing to you. I'm asking you. You've got to give me strength. You've got to give me help. And my friend, you, you trust the Lord. Uh, don't get bitter. Get better. I'll tell you the thing that really builds character in your life is when you can't, but you recognize he can. Amen. And you say, Lord, makes no sense to me, but I know it makes sense to you. Man, I found myself there many times. My wife died. I stood at her grave uh, yesterday, and I wept, put some flowers on my wife's grave, and I, I was standing there weeping. And I'm saying to myself under my breath, this don't make any sense to me. She never did anything but good. She loved people. She gave her life to help people, vested her life in people. I don't understand this. But I could stand there and look at that closed coughing, and I could think down in my soul, there's going to be a better day. Because Jesus lives, there's going to be a meeting place. And my friend, when Jesus gets on board of the problem, it can, it can turn the problem into a blessing. Yes, because you realize that whatever you're going through, whatever you're seeing, whatever you're experiencing, it's going to soon be over. And the only thing that really matters is our dependence, our reliance upon the Lord, the one and the only one that at times can come to our side and help us. These guys in the upper room, they're desperate, but God showed up. Jesus showed up in the nick of time, and he said, your hearts are troubled, but he said, peace be unto you. That's what the resurrected Christ brings to us. I've watched the dear saints of God down through the years in sickness and on their deathbeds. I've watched them. I've listened to them. I've heard them respond to the goodness of God in very difficult situations. 
They've testified that God has been by their side. They've testified that God has strengthened them in their weakness. They've testified that God's been good to them because they've experienced it. Listen, the resurrected Savior is with us. He hasn't left us. He's with us. And he's going to be with us. Sometimes we have health crisis. I'm thinking of Brother Ray over here tonight. Brother Ray's got a health crisis. The doctors have said to Brother Ray, you've got months. If you don't take the medicine, you've got less than months. And I haven't heard him complain one time. I've heard Brother Ray say over, he said, I'm not worried about it. He said, the Lord's going to handle it. The Lord's going to take care of it. He said, the Lord's going to see me through. You know what that attitude does? It encourages his own heart. But do you know what else it does? It encourages people around him. Because it's real. It's not fake. It's not made up. It's not put on. It's not a hope so. It's a no so. It's not a maybe so. It's a hope so. And he knows that the Lord who created him is going to see him through the crisis in his life. And by the way, there's, there are things that's worse than death to a Christian. I mean, look, Adrian Rogers, a dear preacher, I had the privilege of meeting him, a great pastor from Memphis, Tennessee, pastor to Bellevue Baptist Church, developed cancer. And after a while, he developed pneumonia in his lungs, and he's at the hospital. And the doctor has told uh, Dr. Rogers and his family they're going to put him on the breathing machine. And just before they put him on the breathing machine, the family gathered around his bed. Dr. Rogers looked at his family, and he looked at the doctor and the nurses standing by his bed, and he said, in a low voice, this is a win-win. Thank God. That's what the Lord does in the downtime. He said, if the Lord touches me and he raises me up, he said, I get to go back here with my earthly family. He said, that's a win. But he said, if the Lord chooses to take me from this bed into his presence, that's a win. So he said, it's a win-win. Either way, the man who Brother Rogers groomed to take his place was also standing in that room, and I was just reading this story in the last few weeks. He said, I looked at Dr. Rogers, and he said, there was the peace of God. No panic, no panic mode. He said, I, I watched him as the, Lord, as the Lord was strengthening him preparing him for what he was facing. And he said the family went over and kissed him, loved on him a minute or two, and they, they walked out of the room, and they're kind of weeping, and they're going down the hallway. And the man who was becoming the pastor of the church said, I followed him. And then he said, I got to think, I want to go back and see him one more time before they put him completely under and he said, I turned around and I went back into that intensive care room and they're in the process of getting the tube down his throat. And he said, Dr. Rogers, see me come in the room. He said, he turned his head a little while they're working with him, smiled a little bit, and he gave him a thumbs up. Only people who know the resurrected Christ can face those dark, dreary moments victoriously and can say with the Apostle Paul, for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. That's the living Christ. That's the resurrected Christ that strengthens us in those hours. And here's a group of people that are horrified and the Lord appears in the crisis moment. And he said, I bring you peace. 
The Apostle Paul had been in prison for two years. And he writes a letter back to the church of Philippi. And he says to these people at Philippi from the prison, in chapter 4, verse number 7, he said, And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. The Lord can keep your heart warm, and he can keep your mind saved to that which is true. And here's what he said. Listen closely. He said, the Lord shall keep your hearts. That word keep, there's the word we get our word guard from. He said, the Lord can guard your heart. And there's no doubt he's using those soldiers who are guarding him in that prison. And he's thinking about that. And he said, these soldiers are guarding me. And they're walking up and down the corridors here where I'm staying. And he said, just as these guards are walking up and down this corridor here, guarding me, so the peace of God is walking up and down the corridors of my soul, walking up and down in front of my heart, keeping my mind intact, keeping my soul intact. That's what the presence of God can do for you. I'm thankful for the people of God that I've been around through the years of my ministry, dear, dear sister, dear lady, an elder, elderly lady, years ago, my first church, I used to go out, if I'd get down a little, I'd go out and drive down a long dirt road. The dirt road ended in her front yard. Big old oak tree there behind her house. And I'd step up on a porch and I'd look through a screen door and I'd see her sitting in there in a wheelchair. And I remember I'd go up and I, I'd knock on that and her name was uh, Mrs. Davis. And I'd go up and knock on that door. She had bad eyesight, real thick glasses. And she'd look and she'd kind of strain her head to see who it was. And I'd say, Miss Davis, this is a preacher. And she'd move her armed, arms up in the air and wave. And she said, preacher, come on in. Sitting there in a wheelchair crippled, sitting there in pain. And I remember many times walking in that house and I would be so encouraged. And she'd say to me, preacher, just want you to know I've been praying for you today. My Lord, here's a lady that's got more problems than I've got. Uh, the, The years has taken its toll on her life. She's living in pain and she's got agony. Her eyesight's gone. Her body's give away. She's sitting there in a wheelchair. But she says, preacher, I've been praying for you today. You know how a person can do that? A living Christ is real to them. It's not a figment of their imagination. It's not a put on. It's real. It's real, as the songwriter has said. It's real down in their soul. It's not a put on. It's real to them. The presence of God is real to them. And when they need help, they know where to go to get it. And they experience it. And they they can say, hallelujah, it's real. To a bunch of troubled disciples, Jesus said, peace. Peace unto you. I'll never forget Dr. B.R. Lincoln telling the story. He was preaching a revival meeting down in the state of Florida. And he had a son who had just been killed in an automobile accident. His son actually traveled a lot with him, but on this particular revival meeting and campaign, his son, for whatever reason, didn't go with him. They came to him in the meeting and said, Dr. Lakin, we hate to tell you, but your son, his name was Ronnie, said, your son Ronnie has been killed in an automobile accident. Of, co- of course, he was crushed. And some of the preachers said to B.R. Lakin, Dr. Lakin, we're going to drive you back to West Virginia. Uh, you don't need to drive that distance by yourself with this tragedy having engulfed your life. 
Dr. Lincoln said, no. He said, I'm going to drive myself. He said, me and the Lord has got to work this thing out. He says, it's solely between me and the Lord. He said, I appreciate your willingness to help me, to drive me back. But he said, there's some things here that me and the Lord's got to get worked out. And I can hear Dr. Lincoln right now, before he went to heaven, I heard him tell it several times. He said, all the way from the state of Florida, all the way to the hills of West Virginia, he said, the Lord sat with me. He said, there was a presence that, that rode with me, that helped me as I made my way back to West Virginia. You see, he knew something that everybody needs to learn. The Lord's in this thing with us. And whatever we're going through, we've got to stay off of the pity trips and quit saying, woe is me. We've got to put our faith in action. We've got to be what we claim to be. We've got to say, I don't understand it, but God's greater than the problem. God's greater than the difficulty. And I got in this thing. He forgave my sins. He said he was going to help me. He's going to be with me. I'm not living anymore. Christ is living in me. I'm going to claim my spiritual birthright. Dr. E.V. Hill, who pastored a church out in California, preached here in Winston-Salem years ago. I attended the service. Great black preacher. God had his hands on his ministry. And he used to talk about his wife, and he called her babe. And he said everywhere, I go, babe's praying for me. He said, babe loves me. He said, babe loves me unconditionally. He said, she has my schedule. And she knows even in different time zones what time I'm in the pulpit. And said, she gets on her knees while I'm in the pulpit. And babe's praying for me. He said, on one occasion, he had some death threats against his, against his life. And he said he woke up one morning and Babe wasn't there with him. And he wondered where Babe was at. And he said, I got up out of the bed and went through the house and I couldn't find Babe. He said, I looked outside my car was gone. And he said, I wondered what Babe had done with my automobile. I wonder where she went. And he said, in a few minutes, babe come driving up in the driveway. And he said, I went out and said, babe, where you been? She said, honey, she said, I know you've had these death threats. And said, I was afraid that maybe somebody's put some kind of bomb in this car. And said, I just wanted to drive this car and make sure you're safe. Now that's love. Brother Hill said that when he was preaching, gets out of the church and he goes home at night or to the motel room. He calls home and he said, babe, sitting on the side of the bed, she's, she's, she's waiting for me to put her to bed. I mean, he's in distant cities, but he says, she's waiting for me to put her in the bed. And he said, I'll call babe and said, I'll talk to her and said, she'll ask me how the meeting went. He said, I'll read some scripture to babe. We'll pray together. He said, every night I tell babe, I said, I love her. And she'll say to me, honey, I love you. And he'll say, all right, babe, now you go to bed. You cover up and you sleep well tonight and we'll be praying for you. That was the kind of relationship he had with his wife and she had with him. And there came that day when he had to say goodbye to her. She died. She died in the hospital. And Dr. Hill said to family members and said to the nurses around him, said, I've got to go down in the chapel. He said, I've got to talk to my Lord. He said, my Lord's going to have to help me with this. He said, I don't understand it. 
But he said, I've got to have a talk with my Lord. He said, I went down in the chapel and I just poured my heart out to God and said, God, I don't understand this. It makes no sense. You've taken the closest thing in my life. It makes no sense. I don't know what you're doing. And he said, I argued with the Lord a little while. And he said, it dawned on me. The Holy Spirit began to speak to me. He said, don't you know I know what I'm doing? I'm still with you. You're going to meet again. I'm going to get you through it. I'm going to give you the grace you need. And he did. He said, the Lord stood by me. I'm glad I can stand in this pulpit tonight and say when we're in the room behind closed doors and all hell seems to be encasing us, I'm glad I can report to you tonight that we have the promise that the Lord still stands by us. The Lord strengthens us. The Lord helps us. The Lord consoles us. The Lord is there and ever-present help in the time of need. I'm glad it's so. And when they needed the Lord the most, the Lord was there to give them strength and comfort. You know something? The fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace. That's what the Holy Spirit gives. Love, joy, and peace. I was out for lunch one day this week down in Walberg. Halfway through my meal, a man comes and stands at my table. His eyes look crazy. He looked, he looked like he was just mentally sick. He raised his voice. He's talking about his mother being in the hospital. I knew this. I've known this guy for years, but wasn't a guy I knew. And he said, I went in the hospital and I got on the floor and I prayed for my mom. And he said, I looked up. They thought my mom was dying. I looked up. My mom's looking around over the room. And he said, I've been experiencing dreams and revelations. And I'm thinking to myself, oh my you got to watch what people say when they say, well, I had a dream last night. Could very well be too much pizza. <laughs> you can dream in technicolor with pizza. <laughs> and he started telling me this story. And then he said, I've been speaking in tongues. He said, do you believe in the gifts of the Spirit? And he's raising his voice. Everybody in the restaurant is looking in my direction. He said, do you believe in the gifts of the Spirit? I said, I believe there are gifts of the Spirit. He said, I was hoping that would soothe his conscience. But I knew what he was going to do. He said, but do you believe in speaking in tongues? And I started to tell him, I believe I could sit down with any intelligent person and open the Bible and I could prove to you, I don't care what you say. Right there, right off. I don't care. Raising his voice. Everybody in there, everybody is looking in our direction. I don't care what you say. He's putting his experience over truth. I know what I've experienced. Boy, have I heard that through the years. Not what the Bible says. It's what my experience teaches me. Oh, he's gone ballistic. And you know, I had the comfort and the ease. He's jumping on me. I'm almost wondering if he's ready to hit me because he's gone ballistic. And he turns and he walks across the restaurant and he had the audacity as he's walking across the restaurant to say, amen, praise the Lord, glory to God, like he's Mr. Spiritual. I'm thinking to myself, the fruit of the Spirit, first of all, is love Amen. and joy, peace. And I heard him say as he got up to the cash register about me, he pointed to me. He said, that man back there has been arguing with me. <laughs> but God gave me peace. That means he's going to be all right. 
God gives peace. And you know, because I kept my, there was a time me and him would have stepped outside. <laughs> but God gave peace. And you know, when he got up to cash register, two of the waitresses came over to the table and they said, this guy's done this before. There's something wrong with that guy. And you know what they said? They came over there as nice as they could be that someone who professes faith in the Lord Jesus Christ didn't have to get as stupid as he was. And they said that guy actually walked in a business recently and started cussing the people in the business and breaking bottles in a business. Something's happened to this guy. And then there's another guy that's put a lot of threats against me recently. Well, I just got perfect peace. You know, I, I like to, and I'm finished. I'm not finished, but I'm finishing. I like to compare it to a duck on the water. Have you ever looked real close at a duck when they're swimming? Have you ever noticed how they're just going along like that and they, they look around and they look at the shore and they look at the other ducks and they seem to be at peace and they quack a little and they look around and they quack a little. But have you ever looked at them real close? Underneath the water, they're doing like that. <laughs> But they, if, you look, if you don't look close, <laughs> if you don't give close inspection, you think they're okay. They seem to be just sailing along just as at ease. But them old, them feet underneath that water, they're wide open. <laughs> and sometimes this world causes us to do like that. But you know I've learned that when we're doing like that, we've got to look around with the peace of God. Yeah. Because God gives peace. And Jesus had met with these disciples in the upper room. And Jesus had said to them, in the, listen, in the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Amen. Hey, we're on the winning side. Amen. We're on the winning side. Let's stand to our feet with our heads bowed, our eyes closed. You may be here tonight fighting some physical battles in your life. You may be here tonight in turmoil. You may be here tonight with problems that you have no solution to or for. God sent me here to tell you that this Savior we're celebrating today can handle it. You, you don't have to fight the, the flesh yourself. You're not in this thing alone. You're not in this thing alone. God's with us. He's with us now, and he's now with us. And if you need help tonight, you need to, you need to give it to him tonight. You need to turn it over to him tonight. He's available to help you. We're going to sing a stanza if others need to come. Spirit of God tonight is in this building. He wants to help us with the infirmity that we experience. He wants to help us with the problem that's overwhelming us. He wants to be real to us tonight, but he'll only do that if we allow him to be real. And we need to hand it over to him tonight, meet at the cross. Meet on resurrection ground because here's a Savior who can handle it for us. Father, thank you tonight for your presence. Thank you tonight for your willingness to help us, for your divine spiritual concern to us and for us. And I pray you'll help us and bless us this evening. Thank you for these who've come and others that need to come. In Jesus' name, we sing a stanza. If others need to come, would you come?
my Lord, I want to thank you tonight. I want to thank you that you are our sufficiency. There are no shortcomings when we fully trust you, confide in you, ask you. I pray you'll bless these who've come. Others tonight who may be troubled. Lord, help them to have the ability to fully lean upon you, trust you, believe in you and on you, ask of you, turn it over to you, get it off of our shoulders. You said casting all of our care upon you because you care for us. Pray you'll bless us and help us because we're needy people. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen.